<clears throat> I'll relay those to Bob later after after he's done. So Bob, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everybody. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is soil because it's most important. Uh, I tried to figure out who I was talking for today, and I, I usually put master gardeners and and the all that other stuff. But today I figured I was just talking to Woodlands Green, so I'm yours today. I'm a member of the Woodlands Green today. Uh, a noted French theologian, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, said that uh, man was a living layer of earth. Uh, and he was speaking of the spiritual realm. Um, I'm saying on the realistic realm that soil is really the living layer of earth. Soil should be alive. And what I'm going to talk about today is the process of developing live soil in order for us to not only have wonderful gardens and, and uh, lush greenery, but also uh, for our native plants, because it's most important. The soil, the soil that was here once, uh, the native plants evolved in, and uh, a lot of it's not here today, and I'm gonna talk about that for a minute as well. But um, I'm really glad to be here, and I'm glad that all of you are here to, uh, to join me on this. Uh, as you can see, this is beautiful soil, by the way. It's got a lot of rocks in it. But the point I was I was trying to make earlier is that we have, in some way, or one way or another, disturbed so much soil on this planet that we need to learn how to stop destroying it and and to make it back into what it originally was. For instance, uh, here's a map of the world. 14.6% of all the land area has been modified by humans on this planet. Uh, and that's a significant amount, I think. By the year 2050, it's gonna be significantly more than that, mainly because we have a growth in population, more growth in population, and rising seawaters are gonna solve a lot of the uh, the land problems, so we'll have a lot less land. But it's not just 14.6% that has been modified by humans. 50%, another 50%, has been disturbed by humans in, in some way. 34%, um, a 35.4%, the only, uh, only 35.4% has been unchanged on the entire planet. And, I think that's significant to where it's a sobering thought that a hundred years ago, none of this had happened. We had not done this, but once the industrial age started uh, and, and the modern age started, things have changed significantly. And I think we're, we as humans have this hubris that, uh, you know, we're in charge of everything, but I, it's, it's interesting that that may not be the case. So what we're seeing, every interstate that they build, uh, every, they build every city that they expand on, uh, you can see what's, what's happening here, um, is lessening the amount of soil, not only for native plants or for gardens, but for crops to feed the world. Uh, and that's something that we kind of need to look at, I think. I, I know it was an eye-opener for me to see that only 35% uh, of, the, of the earth has been undisturbed. And let's look at Montgomery County, for instance. From 2001 to 2019, uh, we have had uh, a significant decline in open land. Uh, as you can see here, uh, cultivated crops, not too much, but in pasture, we've lost uh, about uh, eight, nine uh, acres. You can look through the list, uh, herbaceous uh, grasslands, deciduous forest, evergreen forest. Look at the significant amount, uh, almost 30 acres of, uh, excuse me, almost 25 acres, mixed forests, and all of these things 
75, 75.5 uh, acres, a uh, mile, square miles have been taken up by development and just in Montgomery County. And that's just in the last uh, uh, few years. And I don't have the figures for 23, but in since we moved up to Willis, we have seen tremendous growth. I thought we were moving to the country, but we're moving, this is basically Houston. So uh, it, it was an eye opener here too. Right now, there are 3.5 million acres of turf grass in the state of Texas. The cost of irrigating it alone is $700 million per year. Now, you can't eat the, the grass, you can't wear it, and if you're so inclined, you can't smoke it. Don't laugh, I know some of you out there have tried it. Uh, so it has no purpose. It's the fourth largest crop in the state, next to corn and sorghum and cotton, but it's totally useless. And, and that, that came as a revelation to me. I know everybody likes the green carpet and all that stuff, but it's, it's, it's totally worthless. It has no point. It's not even really pretty. Uh, anyway, I'll go on. I'll stop, get off my soapbox. A robust long-term ecosystem restoration relies not just on replanting native vegetation, but on the recovery of the underlying soil uh, by over, biodiversity. And what we have done, or what has been happening is we have con continually destroyed the underlying soil biodiversity. When that happens, we have dead soil. And because one, the biodiversity, the biome, the soil biome, the organisms that live in the soil have died. The ground, the soil becomes dead and it collapses on itself, becomes a calcium carbonate uh, surface, which is hard. When you water it, it goes, the water just sheets off into the, into the street or wherever it's going. Uh, and also uh, the go with it go the chemical fertilizers, the chemical uh, pesticides and all of these other things, the fungicides and all that. that. Those all go into the streams and waterways. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, long-term ecosystem, re ecosystem re restoration, we need to start looking at that, I think. Uh, and uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I I'm actually preaching to the preachers, I think, but uh, that's, what I mean. So let's look at soil. Soil is made up of five ingredients, minerals, organic matter, living organisms, gases, and water. And there is an incredible symbiotic relationship between plants and these five ingredients, particularly the living organisms. And I'm going to go through that and explain how these living organisms actually help plants uh, and continue to grow and thrive, uh, but also the lack of them uh, led to places, uh, things like the Dust Bowl in the 1920s, when people started using these massive amounts of chemical fertilizers uh, that were left over from World War I uh, to fertilize their fields. You remember Timothy McVeigh blew up the Oklahoma a building, Oklahoma City building, with nothing but fertilizer. So chemical fertilizers are expensive and detrimental. But anyway, so anyway, let's go on. Minerals. What are minerals? Minerals are those little tiny grains of sand uh, that have deposited in themselves all over the world. They were eroded from mountains and boulders uh, by wind and rain and climate, uh, freezing and, and unfreezing, freezing and thawing uh, into tiny, tiny little particles. And those particles are what we call dirt. They're not alive. It's just particles of minerals. Now, how do plants get those particles of minerals? They need to have them. And here are the nutrients that they need that are in those minerals everything except nitrogen. But the macronutrients 
that plants need are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. There are secondary nutrients that they also need, magnesium, sulfur, calcium, and there are a ton of micronutrients, boron, iron, manganese, copper, zinc, molybdenum, and chlorine. Uh, those are all ingredients that plants need to thrive and grow. Um, and here they are. Sorry. I said with the exception of nitrogen, nitrogen is not uh, a part of the minerals that are in the soil. Although there's, you know, it's the most plentiful gas in the, on the planet, but plants can't take in nitrogen from the air. There are only four ways that plants can get nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen fixation from free living bacteria in the soil, when they get in there and they create the nitrogen or they fix it from the air that flows into the soil, uh, they fix it and transfer it to the plants. Uh, from bacteria living symbiotically in not nodules in the roots of legumes. You've always heard plant green beans or peas in your garden and it will fix the nitrogen. Well, that's what happens. The bacteria that's living symbiotically down there uh, are actually helping to produce a nitrogen and release it into the soil. The third one is from nitrogen infused rain. And people say after it rains, oh my God, everything looks so green. Well, that's because it is green. Nitrogen helps the plant uh, produce uh, chlorophyll, which if it's infused with, uh, with uh, from rain, it will automatically green up the plants, not because it fell on the plants, because it fell on the soil. And the soil, it took it up and transferred it through these bacteria and other organisms into the plant. That's how it takes it up uh, or from fertilizer. The last one is from fertilizer. And I, you know, there are lots of different fertilizers. I think Mike Sarant's gonna be talking to you. Mike's a good friend and Mike knows what he's doing there. Uh, and his products are, are wonderful. I use them myself, but he understands the difference between chemical fertilizers and organic fertilizers. And I think it would be good for all of us to, to hear what he has to say. Um, now, let's go on, if I can get on. Excuse me one second. Not sure how, why this is doing this. There we go. Whoops. I'm trying to get this to start again and it's not. Okay, let's see what we can do here. There we go. Soil. Now soil is the medium from which all plant nutrients are assimilated by the plants. So there needs to be water in soil. And, and the difference between soil and dirt is that dirt is not living. Soil is living. Soil is abundance of microbes. I think Paul mentioned in, the, uh, in his uh, article about the, this presentation about earthworms. And I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute, but the, uh, the relationship of the, all the minerals and all the nutrients, the air, the water, all of these things are dependent on the microbes for developing this. Microbes use that water. Uh, some of it goes to the plant, but microbes also use it to, to uh, dissolve the tiny mineral par particles that are in the soil. So they perform all kinds of functions. It is a jungle down there, as they say. Um, organic matter. Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, as you can see, I mean, I compost my own, I do my own compost. I never have enough, but I do my own compost. And, uh, and I use all kinds of things there. Uh, the, 
environmental services in woodlands i think has a compost class every month uh, there are all kinds of books rodale has a book on composting there's some great other books on composting if you haven't been composting i know a lot of people come and say oh my god composting you know you're going to attack attract rats and all kinds of stuff i never have had that problem i've been composting for 20 years and i've never ever had that problem uh, so uh, don't worry about that it's it's not a it's not a problem but anyway organic matter is necessary for life in the soil uh, and that's because it contains nutrients and other uh, material that goes into the soil. For instance, uh, if you look at these leaves on the, uh, the two uh, on the upper right pictures, there's also some saprophytes there, and I'm going to talk about those in a minute too. But the leaves in the middle picture, 70% uh, approximately, 70% of all of a plant's nutrients are in its leaves. So when the leaves fall to the ground, they have those nutrients in their leaves. Those nutrients are transferred in the wild back into the soil. We tend to rake up our leaves and put them in bags and put them by the, by the street. That is not what nature does. Nature takes these leaves, dissembles them, decomposes them, and then turns them into humus which allows the microorganisms to live so it's a totally different way of thinking about how we do things saprophytes too or something interesting i'll talk about that in a minute too although terry probably knows more about saprophytes than i do uh, and also she knows more about micro uh, mycorrhizal fungi which i'll touch on as well organic matter in the soil now, we have organic matter in the soil, which is residue and living microbes. We have active soil organic matter, which is referred to as detritus. And we have stable organic matter, which is referred to as humus. So we have these three processes. And as you can see in the lower picture, uh, that is rich, rich soil. And it's alive with all kinds of organisms. And here are some of the organisms. I'm going to show you some photographs of them, but here are some of the organisms that are necessary for soil life. There are two things we can say about them. One thing is that um, fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, do not have anything to do with the soil. Chemical fertilizers go right directly to the plant, to the plant roots, go up and uh, provide whatever nutrients the plant needs. Uh, in fact, it might kill, it probably will kill the bacteria in the soil. I have seen so, so many yards in the woodlands and all over Montgomery County that I have tried to take samples from and the soil is, or the dirt is so hard that I broke my trowel one time, just trying to take a sample out of the soil. That soil is dead. And we wonder why we have uh, problems with our lawns, uh, you know, take all patch and large patch and all these other things. And the reason why we're having those problems is not because we didn't put enough fertilizer on them, is not because we did we nuked them uh, uh, with whatever we wanted to nuke them with. It's because the soil is dead. So the plant, you can't have that whole life cycle that you need for plants. So if we look at this, we have organic debris down in the, in the bottom, uh, and we have what we call uh, detrivores, which are earthworms, even snails. Some fungi, which is a saprophytes, they will uh, also disintegrate or, or eat, uh, decompose uh, leaf matter or, or any kind of organic debris, and also bacteria. And then from there, you have other animals, higher, a little bit higher animals uh, that will um, eat these animals and also eat the fungi and all, all this other stuff. So you have springtails, mites, beetles, protozoa uh, that are eating all these. And then on the outside of this, you have all kinds of 
other things. You have ground beetles, pseudoscorpions, mites, centipedes, road beetles, all of these things. So there's a cir circle here. Once these creatures, the, bit, the creatures on top, uh, eat all of, all of this food, they themselves are, are either live, give their little bodies back into the soil, or they're eaten by larger predators. So if you can imagine um, uh, of the, uh, the veldt in Africa, the savannah, and you have these great big herds of, of wildebeest going through there, and along, along the way, there are a few prides of lions. The lions are the predators, the, her the, uh, the herbivores, the detrivores, or the uh, wildebeest, and the lions are just there to keep them in check. Um, so if you think about that, that that's a cycle of life, the same cycle is going on in the soil, in good soil. So let me go on. So here are some detrivores, decomposers, and saprophages. Uh, protect the detrivores, please, in the soil, which include uh, millipedes, springtails, and I would say a, a thing about springtails. I was turning my compost the other day, and I saw a centipede come out from under the still tiny centipede, about this long, come out from under uh, some of my compost. And I turned it over, and I looked, and there were a bunch of springtails under there. And they were eating the, the uh, plant marrow, and that uh, centipede was actually eating them. So it was, it's a predator. So it's interesting. And then it eats them, and then those little bodies or whatever's left of them go back into the soil. It's a tremendous, tremendously attractive uh, cycle. Sow bugs. And here's the most important, I think, earthworms. And Paul mentioned that in his, uh, in his introduction. Saprotrophs are, uh, are mushrooms, uh, fungi, that actually help decompose too. There are a lot of different kinds of fungi out there. And, and of course, Terry is the, is the great expert on it. And she can, she can probably talk for hours on this, but uh, I'm gonna talk about another type of uh, a fungi in a minute that is not a saprotroph, uh, but it has incredible capabilities. And they've been doing studies on it for maybe the last 10 years, but not very far past then. Uh, it's, it's amazing, and I'll talk about that, but I wanna talk about the earthworms first. The most important detrivore in all of the soil is earthworms. If you have earthworms, yes, you have good soil. Uh, the earthworms do soil aeration. They make their little tubes up and down, their uh, vertical tubes. The water and air can get down into the soil. They improve the soil structure. They recycle nutrients. I'll talk about that in a minute too. Water movement, they help the water move through the, through the soil and they're extraordinarily important for plant growth. Um, the average earthworm produces its own weight in castings every 24 hours. And the other thing about earthworms is when they, they eat these detritus, this detritus, uh, whether it's a piece of leaf or a piece of grass or whatever, um, it passes through their gut. And when it passes through their gut, they inoculate it with, their, with the bacteria in their gut, which is the same bacteria that is needed to uh, develop the living soil. So it's really a symbiotic relationship that it has. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Uh, so the average earthworm produces its own weight in castings every 24 hours. Earthworms in one acre of land can bring to the surface over 20 tons, that's 40,000 pounds of soil in one year. To me, that's fantastic. I'm sure everyone's heard of Charles Darwin. He wrote Origin of Species, of course, and then he wrote another book, which was actually more popular than uh, uh, Origin of Species uh, while he was alive in the formation of vegetable mold through the action of worms. And it was actually bestseller. And 
what he what Darwin did was he would go out in the daytime and find these holes, these vertical holes for earthworms. And uh, he would put little bits of leaves or any kind of organic material down at those holes. And then he'd go at night with a lantern and watch and see these little earthworms come up from the soil and grab that little piece of leaf and take it back down again into the soil. And they ate, they'd eat that leaf, pass it through their gut, and then eject it into the soil and make the soil even richer than it could be. So if you have earthworms, you have good soil. They and, and people say, well, I have to buy them. No. If you if you make the good soil, they'll come. They'll be there. Now let's talk a little bit about predators. We have protozoas. Uh, which eat bacteria and help distribute the nutrients, amoebas, hydras, paramecians, all of these things uh, eat bacteria and they help distribute the nutrients to be taken up again and again and again and brought back to the plants. So it's kind of like the soil is kind of like the stomach of the earth, you know, uh, it's, it's alive and it's alive with some of the similar bacteria that live in our own human uh, uh, bodies. So it's something important to, to realize. Uh, here are some of the predators. We have uh, up in the upper left, you have a, uh, a, a microscopic spider. And then of course, ants in the, far, uh, in the bottom right. And then in the middle, we have a pseudoscorpion, a centipede. Uh, these are nematodes and nematodes can be beneficial. They can eat uh, uh, bad uh, organisms in the soil, but they also can be detrimental to plants. So there's different species that work there. And also these uh, microscopic mites. Uh, so these are all in the soil. And people say, oh, I got ants in my compost. Well, I leave my ants in the compost because they're, what they're doing is they're eating all the little dead things that are growing in the in the garden or, or in the compost. So yeah, I don't, I don't worry about them. Say hello to soil microbes, friends. I'll show you. This is not my daughter, but my daughter, I caught eating an earthworm one day when she was about this age, uh, one of my daughters. Uh, and I just thought that was a great picture. This kid has got an abundance of soil microbes in his system which are probably good. And let's talk about the different kinds. This is uh, mycorrhizal fungi. I have a better picture of it in a minute, but if you can see these tiny little fibers coming out from the root systems, those are all mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi has a incredible purpose in the soil uh, and Terry may have told you this before, but mycorrhizal fungi can, in a forest, for instance, it can spread 40 miles from tree to tree, from species to species, all the way through a forest. Uh, this guy, Michael Phillips, who owns a, uh, an apple orchard, he's also a soil scientist uh, who owns an apple orchard up in New Hampshire. Uh, did some incredible studies about mycorrhizal fungi. And one of the things he found out was, let's say you have a, a row of trees or you have a bunch of trees uh, and there may be a, a line of trees 100 yards across. Mycorrhizal fungi in good soil will actually populate each one of those. In other words, it'll start at one point and it'll spread its fibers all through that uh, those trees all through that hundred yards of trees. And there might be different kinds of trees. You might have a pear tree and a pine tree and whatever else, you know, an oak tree. And let's say that the tree at the far end, the soil has no nutrients or very few. So it's going to be weaker than the trees on the other end, which have a lot of nutrients. Somehow, Mycorrhizal fungi knows that that tree needs nutrients and it will bypass all these other trees to bring nutrients to that one tree. 
Now, I don't think it knows in the sense that we know things, but you know, they haven't actually figured out how it knows and how it transmits that information back and forth. Um, it's to me, it's it's really marvelous, and it's a new science. They're just studying it now, uh, and Terry can probably tell you much more about it than I can. But it's I, I find it fascinating, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing learning more about it. Uh, here is this is called actinomycetes. Uh, actinomycetes helps protect plants from soil-borne diseases. Now, you've heard of streptomycin and endomycin and all the mycins that are, are antibiotics. All of those are taken from actinomycetes that lives in the soil. Well, now they, they, they have them growing in laboratories, but uh, the, uh, the actinomycetes has a real function in the soil and it, as it does for our own health, our own human health. Uh, it also, there are certain species of actinomycetes which can be absorbed through the skin. And when they're absorbed through the skin, some of them can actually go into the bloodstream and they go up to your brain and they reduce, release serotonin into your system. Uh, and I'm not making a joke here, but you see gardeners who are smiling all the time that's probably the reason, or it could be one of the reasons they're smiling. Uh, soil bacteria uh, is the next one I wanna talk about. And soil bacteria, they dissolve the minerals. Remember I said that the water comes down and that plays a big important part in getting those minerals. Well, that water helps the, the uh, microbes, the soil bacteria bind to those little soil particles that are, uh, those little dirt particles, rock particles that are in the soil and it dissolves them in that way. Once it dissolves them, it passes it on to the uh, mycorrhizal fungi, which then brings it to the plant. It's a sim mycorrhizal has a symbiotic relationship with the plant. It brings nutrients and the plant gives it sugar. So there's a, a real symbi symbiosis there. And finally, protozoas, which kind of are the lions of the, of the uh, microscopic world. Uh, they just they just help uh, keep bacteria populations in balance. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, they do serve a purpose. And then when they die, uh, you know, if they do die, when they, when they die, uh, their little bodies become part of the soil biomes, the soil universe. So soil bacteria uh, can change the soil environment so that plant species can exist and proliferate. They recycle nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, and other nutrients. They improve nutrients and water efficiencies. They reduce disease and stress problems, and they help rooting and soil aeration. And one thing I didn't mention before, uh, talking about uh, way back when we are talking about the uh, uh, nitrogen in the soil. If you remember, uh, I was talking about uh, rainwater, and that's one of the ways soil uh, plants receive uh, nitrogen. Well, the reason that is, is because lightning uh, can transform an H2O molecule with a, a, an atom of nitrogen. And when it, it fuses those two together, and so when the rain comes down, it, is, it actually has nitrogen in it and the nitrogen goes into the soil and it's why plants green up. So that's the explanation. Mycorrhizal fungi, I talked about it a little bit. Mycorrhizal fungi collects nutrients from the soil and brings them to plants in exchange for sugars. Uh, they act as uh, extensions really of the root system. Uh, it's, it's almost magical what they're doing. I, I'm just totally uh, flabbergasted. And here is a better picture I talked about. There's a little pine tree there. And as you can see, all of those little filaments down there, the, down at the bottom and on the sides, that's all mycorrhizal fungi. That's not roots. So it's, it's really interesting how that can populate that whole system and it really extend the root system so it can bring more nutrients back to the plant. It None of these creatures and or, or living things 
can exist in dead soil. None of them. They are essential to good soil. Now, how many bacteria and protozoa? Yeah, I mean, this is pretty clear. In a teaspoon of soil, there should be about 100 million to 1 billion uh, bacteria. Different species of bacteria, but bacteria all the same. Fungi, probably several yards. It could be in the prairie, uh, it could be hundreds of yards, and in the forest, probably one to 40 miles. I mean, and this has been proven, they're doing some incredibly uh, good studies up in Canada. Uh, Susan Simard, who wrote the book, um, Finding the Mother Tree, has been doing some extraordinary uh, studies on mycorrhizal fungi up in Canada in the, in the pine forests uh, up there, and, uh, or the conifer forests. And she has come up with some really, really interesting data. So if you get a chance to read her book, I have it on the recommendation, book recommendations. Protozoa, you should have a thousand, at least a thousand protozoa in a teaspoon. Same in a prairie, but in forest, you could have a hundred thousand uh, protozoa in a teaspoon of soil. And you can imagine what a, sho uh, a shovel full would be or a truckload. I mean, to me, that's uh, unbelievable. But all of these things come together to form uh, nutrients for the plants to do their thing, uh, to grow, to produce uh, chlorophyll, to create photosynthesis, to have nutrients brought up to the leaves and the, and the stems to help produce flowers and fruit. All of those things are necessary uh, for the plant and for good soil. So if we don't have that, we can't have those healthy processes. Uh, I'm going to talk about invasive plants in a minute, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, um, the soil biome as a whole. And I call this the soil biome because it is a living thing. Um, it's so important for us to realize that there is a process uh, between chemicals and uh, organic systems that are mutually exclusive. And, I, and I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, organics, organic fertilizers, organic uh, anything, uh, feed, do not feed the plants. They feed the organisms in the soil. Those organisms then take that food and transmit it through a whole process of sy systems back to the plant. And that's how the plant takes up its nutrients. Chemical fertilizers, on the other hand, come in and just go right to the roots of the plant, bypassing all of that biome. So that biome eventually dies because it does not have the nutrients it needs in there to sustain its life. That's why your soil gets so hard. That's why it's, it's almost impossible to grow beautiful grass here because of those things, because we, we've neglected that in a lot of ways. So let's talk about invasive plants for a minute. Uh, I don't know if Kathy's there, but Kathy, <laughs> these, are, these are air potatoes. Uh, they disrupt mutual associations between natives and invasives. They alter the, so the way soil nutrients are distributed. And that's incredibly, incredibly critical. And they introduce plant pathogens. But most importantly, they change the soil food web so that native plants and other plants that are adapted here cannot get the nutrients they need. And that is the reason why invasive plants are so uh, terrible. Now, I'm gonna get off my, my uh, podium and talk about native plants because there's some gorgeous, beautiful native plants out there that we should all be considering for our lawn. Uh, drum and red maple. And here's the other interesting thing. 
there are 1,100 species of native bees in the state of Texas. Native bees, not, uh, not uh, honeybees. There are also, <clears throat> excuse me, about 600 species of butterflies and moths that live here at least part of the time during the year uh, who rely exclusively on native plants. Uh, by not having those natives or by replacing those natives with plants that have no, no reason being here, uh, we we're reducing the food, the nectar, the uh, uh, pollen, uh, and all the other things that are related to uh, our butterflies, bees, other insects, birds. Um, for instance, it takes 6,000 caterpillars uh, to feed for a chickadee to raise four to five eggs to maturity, 6,000. Now, what provides that? Oak trees, and I'll show you that in a minute. But let's look at the morning cloak, the tiger swallowtail, and that pretty little rose, rosy maple moth that uh, are, are all uh, uh, used to lay their eggs on drum and red maple, and their larvae eat the leaves. Uh, of the drum and maple. And, uh, you know, we don't think about those things. I never did it for a long time. But as you can see, these beautiful, beautiful plant uh, butterflies and moths. Loblolly pine, for instance, the uh, elfin butterfly, the southern pine sphinx moth. I'm sure you've seen these. I, when I was a kid, we used to look for those because it's so hard to see. But if you look closely, you can find them. Um, just on a loblolly pine. How are we doing with time, Paul? Ooh, okay. Uh, white oak, uh, Edwards uh, hair streak butterfly, Eastern redbud. Now, if you don't plant an Eastern redbud, shame on you. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant and it's native to our area. Uh, Parsley hawthorn. We were over at uh, Mercer this morning with uh, Native Plant Society. Uh, we're going to be teaching a class over there for uh, landscaping. And uh, there's a beautiful parsley hawthorn out there. Uh, that's fantastic. So you get a chance to go out to Mercer. But it is the larval host for the gray hair streak butterfly, the red spotted purple butterfly, and the viceroy butterfly. And you see viceroy looks kind of like a monarch. It's smaller, but it does look like a, a monarch. Wax myrtle. Uh, this is what they made uh, uh, bayberry perfume and bayberry uh, uh, hair products and all this stuff back in in the two centuries ago. Uh, it is the larval species for the hair streak butterflies, uh, American beautyberry, gorgeous plant. There are people who make jelly out of those uh, berries. The only problem with this is that if you eat the berries, they don't taste very, they're edible, excuse me, they're edible, but not eatable. They don't taste very good. But if you put pectin and sugar in them, they get this marvelous tangy flavor that's out of sight. Button bush, gorgeous, gorgeous plant, uh, as you can see. They like sun and they like water. So that gorgeous plant, coral bean, uh, in, I was telling someone today in Louisiana, as John was saying, uh, in or Paul, Louisiana, um, we call that a mamu plant. And don't ask me why, I have absolutely no idea. Um, but one of the things I really love about this plant is when it produces, it'll produce a bean that has a black um, covering, the black coating. And in the wintertime, those beans pop out, uh, the, the um, coating opens, the pod opens, and you have these little scarlet, as you can see on the screen, these little scarlet beads on here. It's incredibly beautiful. And I just, I love this plant because of that, not necessarily because of the flowers, although they're pretty too. It's also called a fireman's cap. Um, but coral bean is a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. Uh, the berries are not edible. So 
don't go eating them because you will you will get sick. Turk's cap. Uh, I'll tell you a story about Turk's cap. Turk's cap is a hibiscus. It's a member of the hibiscus family. It is a native. It is a beautiful flower. It loves shade. Uh, so if you have a backyard, where, as most people do, with a lot of trees, this is a great plant to have back there. Uh, I have seen Turk's cap. It refills its uh, nectar very quickly. All plants, all flowers do that. Plants with flowers actually refill with nectar. So when the when the butterfly comes to take the nectar or the hummingbird, they'll refill it back. But Turk's cap fills it back quickly. I was watching some hummingbirds around my Turk's cap, and this one hummingbird went to this specific uh, Turk, uh, Turk's cap plant and drank all the nectar and then flew away. And about 30 minutes later, he came back and drank the nectar again. And I thought, man, that was fast. And it was fast. So Turk's cap replenished their nectar very quickly. Green milkweed. It is the uh, larval, so a larval source for the monarch butterfly, the soldier butterfly, and the queen butterfly. Uh, and they all look very much alike. Um, and so it sounds like a, uh, a hierarchy here, monarch, queen, soldier, and then we have a viceroy over there too, in some place. Um, wine cup, it is a beautiful, it will make a great, great ground cover. Uh, it, you can mow it back down every year, it'll come back. Um, it is the larval food source for the gray hair streak butterfly. And that's a beautiful little butterfly too. Um, blue mist flowers, uh, just really, really pretty flowers. And this is a lance leaf coreopsis. As you can see in the upper right, there is a, uh, the, the leaves look like lances, like the spearheads. So I, I think it's really a, a great flower. As you can see, this honeybee is just gorging himself on pollen there. Uh, great plant. Gora. Uh, this is one of uh, Lindenheimer's uh, discoveries. It's a pretty, pretty little prairie plant. Uh, and I love it. I love Gora. It's, it's, it's tiny. The flowers are tiny, but they grow on these little tiny stems and they look like they're just little creatures floating above the plant, which uh, it's really astounding. Gay feather, liatris, uh, or they grow in these long tails up here. Uh, there's different colors, but this is uh, uh, the one I like the best. Uh, and I have some growing. I really like this plant. Uh, my mother's name was Liatris, and I thought that was a pretty name. I, I don't know how she, being French, how she got the name Liatris because that's a Latin name, but you know, who knows? Anyway, uh, cardinal flowers, Lobelia cardinalis. Uh, I have one of these. It's, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. Uh, and it, hummingbirds love them, love them. And you plant one of these, you'll have hummingbirds. Bee balm, bergamot, uh, and monarda. Uh, that's the same thing. And it's a member of the mint family. Uh, as you can see, the, the flowers are great. I cut mine back in the after they bloom the first time, and then they might, they'll bloom again in the early fall. So they bloom in the spring, late spring, and then cut them back, they'll bloom again in the early fall. Fall obedient plant, wow. Can you get more beautiful than that? That's gorgeous. Blue sage, uh, salvia azuria. It is, that is a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. And you can see this in your, and even if you don't want to plant native, all native plants, my, I took out all the grass in my lawn and just put native plants in. Um, but, uh, well, and I do have a few roses and I planted a peach tree for the kids in the neighborhood. I have one in the back for me and one in the front. It's open to the kids. They can come eat peaches. Uh, so uh, these are so attractive. I was going to say, that one of the great things for this is that uh, these plants can make great accent plants 
in your garden, even if you don't want to do what I did and take all your grass out and put native plants in, uh, all native plants, it, there's a great accent plants that you can plant various places in your garden just to have that, that feeling of, of what it's like to have native plants. Tropical sage, uh, it's also called scarlet sage, salvia coccinea, uh, gorgeous, beautiful red plant, uh, red flowers, just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, this is horse herb. Now, interesting, we were talking about this today. As you can see in this photograph, this horse herb has been mowed. It's, you can use horse, horse, herb, horse herb as a um, ground cover in shaded areas. It really loves shaded areas. And so you can plant it in shaded areas. And then if it gets a little high, you can just mow it down. It'll come back and it'll be beautiful. Little yellow flowers. It's, it's really nice. So if you can't grow St. Augustine, put some horse herb in there. Or you can do frog fruit. There are good examples of both horse herb and frog fruit at Mercer uh, Botanical Gardens. So you might want to go over there and look at it. They've some really big areas that are covered with this. So I, I think it's really an interesting thing. And, uh, and here's another uh, example of uh, frog fruit as almost as a lawn. Um, pigeon berry. Pigeon berry has a unique um, ability to have its berries and its flowers producing at the same time. That's one of the few plants that does this. They grow, they're a low ground cover. Uh, I've seen them, some of them a foot high, but generally they're about six inches high. Uh, and they call it pigeon berry because the pigeons and doves love the berries and they will come down and, and rummage around and eat those berries all the time. And, and that's a great plant to have. Uh, it likes a little shade. So be careful, coral berry, same thing. Look at this. This is so beautiful. It's a gorgeous plant. Uh, wood fern. Now, wood fern is a great plant for uh, a backdrop uh, in, your, in your lawn or in your yard. Put it as a backdrop. Cross vine. Uh, Bignonia capriolata. Uh, people say, oh, this is a, some kind of weed. No, it's cross vine is a beautiful flower. The hummingbirds love it. Uh, butterflies love it. It's actually gorgeous. Carolina jessamine. Some people say jasmine, but it's a, a jessamine is really the name of it. And um, in our area, this is the first flower that blooms, first native flower that blooms in the spring. And you can see it growing in the trees. It likes, it's a vine and it will grow way up in the trees and uh, have these beautiful yellow flowers. This is a cultivated native and somebody's growing it, of course, on their fence. And that's beautiful too. Uh, whoops. And that's, that's the flower. And this is cor coral honeysuckle. I have some of this growing in my backyard. Look how pretty that is. And what I like is the, it kind of forms a little archway to go into the forest. I like that a lot. And then I talked about air potatoes. Big time invasive, especially in the woodlands. And I'm sure some of you have participated in Kathy's uh, rampages through the woodlands taking this out. Chinese privet, Ligostrum, it is incredibly invasive. Please don't plant this. If you have it, plant something else. And besides, there's plenty of beautiful plants that are not invasive and don't force out native plants. Uh, this Chinese privet and the other plant not only force them out, but it changes the quality of the soil. Some of them are allelopathic, which means that they actually poison the soil so that other plants can't grow there that they are the only plants that can grow there. So Chinese privet, you can tell them by the opposite leaves, instead of alternating leaves, the leaves are, uh, the leaves are directly opposed to each other. Please, Japanese honeysuckle, yeah, it's a pretty plant, but is it invasive? It's incredibly invasive and it will kill other plants, other native plants. So it's not a native, it comes from Japan, 
And yeah, it's pretty, but it's invasive. And this is an Andina. Everybody's got an Andina in their yard. Um, and I don't know why, I guess these companies, landscaping companies pick out a number of plants and they say, okay, we're gonna put these in in this neighborhood. Um, but Nandina is incredibly uh, invasive. Please, if you have Nandina, replace it with something else. Dig up the roots. And of course, Chinese tallow. I've had so many people tell me, yeah, I know they're invasive, but they have such beautiful autumn foliage. And that's true. But if you like autumn foliage, plant a, uh, a, uh, uh, a maple tree that is native, a drum and maple, which changes beautiful color or a, a, a gum tree, sweet gum tree, or there's other kinds of trees that have gorgeous colors. So I would do some research on that. Um, let me talk, tell you a little bit about some things here. Um, one thing is about my yard. Uh, I have, as, you, as I said, I took out all the lawn in my yard. I live in a small subdivision. Uh, I have a small house and a small yard. We downsized considerably. We moved to Willis from the Woodlands. We didn't give our children the forwarding address. They found us. Um, but uh, we also have a neighbor who actually loves, loves native plants. And she saw my yard and she was going, oh, this is wonderful. I want to do that too. And so she did the same thing. She took all the grass out and she started putting native plants in her front yard and her backyard. Um, and so that was fine. And she started, she had a big, uh, she has a big uh, suburban. And every time she leaves the house, she comes back with the suburban full. I'm, I'm talking literally full of native plants. I mean, she goes to uh, Buchanan, she goes to Joshua, she goes to Arbor Gate, she goes to Nature's Way, she goes everywhere uh, buying native plants. Uh, and so uh, that was okay. And then one night I was going out to get my trash can. Uh, I had left it out, it was about 11 o'clock. Went out and got my can and I was bringing it in and I looked and there was somebody kneeling in my yard with a flat of plants next to her. And it was her, it was this lady. She looked at me like a deer in the headlight, you caught in the headlights, you know? And I said, look, it's okay. Do what you need to do. I, kn I know you like native plants and there's room in my yard, go ahead and plant. Okay, so, and, I, and I forgot about it. Well, several weeks later, I'm, I know the plants were doing fine. Several weeks later, I'm driving uh, to the, through the neighborhood to get my mail and I see, most of my other neighbors have beautiful, have, well, it's not beautiful, but they have lawns. And I see these little native plants coming up in all of these neighborhoods, all of these houses. I go, hmm, something's not right about this. Well, I'm working in my backyard and I hear this terrible row coming from next door. And he's yelling, she's yelling. And finally he says, listen, I am so tired of this. I'm, you're spending a fortune. You're spending a thousand dollars at least a month just on native plants. And I know you love native plants, but this is obsessive. This is a problem. You need to see somebody about this. And she said, I'm not seeing anybody. This is what I want to do. And he said, listen, the neighbors are calling. They are complaining about you planting plants in their yards. And that's not that's not kosher. You can't do that. And she says, well, Bob doesn't mind. And he said, yeah, but Bob is weird. So, okay. She, he says, listen, I am so tired of this. I'm going to, if you don't stop this, I'm leaving you. Well, she had coffee with my wife last week. And she said, sometimes she still misses it. So anyway, I have some, I have some uh, resources here. If you haven't read Susan Samard's Finding the Mother Tree, read it because it's great. And Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, also a great book about native plants. Finding the Mother Tree is Susan Samard's talking about mycorrhizal fungi. And it's just an excellent book. And Braiding Sweetgrass, 
Uh, Robin talks about um, uh, native plants in the prairie. Bob Randall has a book called Year Round Fruits and Plants. How are we doing? Okay, I'm, I'm finished. Y'all can read this, Paul. If you want a list, I'll, I'll email it to you. If people want it, they can have it. And thank you very much. I'm done. Any questions? Yeah, thanks a lot. <clears throat> this, uh, like all of our talks, this one will be on the Facebook. You know, the Woodlands Facebook, uh, not Facebook. Website. YouTube, YouTube channel. And, and John will make sure that that's put up there in the next few days. So this is all there. I don't know. Um, I had a question, but about we talked about the uh, compost. I have two of those going, you know, both of the structures I bought through the woodlands and uh, they're doing real well, have been for years, but now I've noticed that when I dig around and move it, that there aren't any worms. Uh, it used to be, you know, that you would just find them everywhere. So. Yeah, you said something about not having to buy them, but do you have the species, or if you were to buy a little box full, yeah, start. There, there are really two species of worms. There's uh, the Weenotheria fetida, which is a small red wiggler worm. They cannot survive in the wild. Uh, and when I was at Environmental Services, I kept some in a in a tub under my desk. Uh, and they produce really great uh, castings, worm castings. But the other earthworms, or I guess you could buy them. Uh, there's a couple of people in the in the country. I think there's a guy up in uh, uh, what is it, Dobbin, who has some. I don't know what else. I, I, you know, I don't know anybody else that has them. But yeah, I can I mean, get I you a list. Yeah. Yeah, I would appreciate that if you would. I mean, I said I've I have purchased them a long time ago. You know, I guess I think that's probably where they came from. But you just get a little box full of them and, and make sure they're comfy, and you know the weather's right. Okay. But that's the other thing I was thinking too about those people who do have lawns and still. Uh, what I have learned is about composting one is to try to get all the leaves i can you live in the woodlands you're going to have several probably a foot of leaves over the, the season and i have always used a, a mulching lawnmower yep. and that seems to take care of it i don't have to rake them up the ones that i do rake up i put into the compost but if that gets too full i just run my mower over it and i think that's helped soil a lot putting that organic material down so is that one of the comments is fantastic thank you for sharing some of your vast knowledge many many hugs so you know who that is thank you uh, i don't have any other questions i think again appreciate the time i said i i do think um many of us are quote, fans of organic methods, but we don't really understand the depth of what's going on in the soil yeah. and what doesn't go on if you do certain things, you know, that, like you said, organic, inorganic fertilizers and things like that. If you don't kill them, you'll do it with the, and, you know, even the fertilizers that we do use have a lot of salt in it. You end up yeah. salting your soil instead of helping it. And then again, you know, then the big picture there too is the runoff from your yard or your garden will take that fertilizer and pesticide with it along to the spring creek and all of our other bodies of water. So eventually into the into the Galveston Bay and the Gulf. Galveston Bay. Uh, you know, it's interesting there's still DDT in the in the silt in Galveston Bay. Which still I think there. Still there. Again, thank you all for being here. Um, remember May the 4th next week at Hark. I'd like you to come to that. Um, there will be brownies. And I think the uh, 
the talk by Mike Surratt is going to be very informative as well. Terry Mack, you have anything to say to add before we say good night? I saw. I, I really don't have anything to add. I'm I'm speechless now. So thanks, Bob. Yeah, next week. Uh, by the way, next week, if you have uh, joined the Green or renewed your membership since uh, September, October until now, and you have not attended an in-person uh, meeting, this will be one of your last chances to pick up your Dragon Circle member pin. So be sure to be there. Hey, I have, uh, appreciate that. I do have one more here. Do you, Bob, suggest adding compost to help rebuild soil health? And I'm, yeah, that's what you do. Now, even if you have lawns, I would say, you know, you could spread a quarter of inch of compost on your lawn every uh, twice a year, maybe in October and again in March or April uh, for a couple of years and let that compost go down into the soil and the earthworms will take it down um, or the rainwater will take it down and that will help add uh, uh, life to your soil. I would, I could, you could definitely, also it neutralizes the soil. It will make the pH uh, neutral between um, six and seven, somewhere right in that area, which is what lawns like and which most plants like. Is that what you need? Yep. So I think um, I do see some more. What are your thoughts on the orange and red flowered milkweed? We have discussions about what's a native milkweed and what's not or what they really like they really like the world the world uh milkweed which is a it's a plant about this big but it, it's got the uh tiny leaves that whirl their their shapes uh spear shape lance shaped and they whirl around the the plant and uh that was that is the one that i have seen the most monarch uh uh, larvae on. I mean, I don't know that the red and yellow one. I mean, I see butterflies on mine. Um, I haven't seen one monarch this year. Yeah, I think that's a problem. We also, I, I guess, also forget that when we talk about the uh, monarch, we're concerned, of course, with that, but there's so many other pollinators that yep. we don't, you know, we got native bumblebees and wasp and everything else, anything that lands on it and goes from plant to plant is a exactly. pollinator. So yeah. Uh, and I think I said that you were gonna show pictures of your yard, but uh, you didn't. I didn't do that. I, I, Maybe you mainly because it's still picture. still recuperating from the winter. I will have some, but uh, I didn't want to be embarrassed by the uh, looks paucity of flowers out there. I think that's all now. So let me just make sure I don't want to cut anybody a short. Then. Just an outstanding presentation. All right. So hope to see you on the fourth or you can't make that, or even if you do make that, April 30th, be sure to go to the website and look up about the, about the invasive species rampage, I think Bob called it, <laughs> on the 29th, I mean, on 30th of April, this, this coming weekend. Thanks again, and I'll go, uh, John, you can wrap it up.